Hey there, Hour of History podcast fans. This is your host, Stephen Bauman, and this week, my guest is Padraig McGeehan from Ireland. He's come to the Library of Congress in the United States as a scholar of the digital humanities. He's combining the methods of new to study traditional music, the music of old, and it's a fascinating conversation finding out how he's looking at archives all over the United States to find all sorts of different tunes in what is a beautiful tradition, Irish traditional music. If you're interested in the digital humanities, history, Irish music, or just a good conversation, you're going to enjoy this fine conversation. As always, there's a ton of extra content for you at hourofhistory.com. There's suggestions, links, further information, and even a survey that you can fill out to help Padraig get more information for his fascinating project. So thanks so much for listening to the Hour of History podcast. Remember to subscribe, like, and comment. And enjoy. On Hour of History, it's our world anytime, any place. You're listening to the Hour of History podcast, our world anytime, any place. For show notes, links, and more, be sure to visit our website at www.hourofhistory.com. And for all the book recommendations made during the podcast, head over to hourofhistory.com forward slash rex. That's hourofhistory.com forward slash R-E-C-S. Without further delay, your Hour of History starts right now. Hello, and I'm really uh, happy to have Padraig with me today. How are you doing? Not too bad. Thanks very, thanks very much, Stephen, for having me here. Uh, now, this is a much anticipated interview, I think, on on um, both of our sides, both because this is not the first time I've I've talked about traditional music, but because uh, your work seems to be getting out there pretty well. Can you tell uh, the people who don't know you on the Hour of History program a little bit about yourself? Yeah, um, well, I'm Patrick Egan, or Padre Mac Egan in my Irish um, term. I um, come from a place called uh, Wicklow, which is south of Dublin in Ireland, about one and a half hours south of Dublin. And um, I grew up in a, like a small place in the Wicklow Hills, and, and uh, I became a musician from a young age. And uh, I have been living in Ireland until I was about, uh, say, 25 or that. And then I started traveling and I was in different locations around the world. And now here I am in the U.S. for one year in the Library of Congress. Uh, so, <laughs> well, that's that's quite a quite a journey that I, I think we should spend some time to unpack now. <laughs> you, you say you became a musician. I, I certainly know for myself uh, that process wasn't so easy, you know, like I, thankfully my school had a public orchestra event where I could go and then I begged my mom for years and then we finally found a teacher, you know, how, how did you become a musician? What is your relationship with music? Mm. So this is really interesting because I was listening to your um, podcast before with Sarah Goick and uh, coming from a, an Irish perspective, it's a lot more um, kind of instilled from a young age and it's a sort of nearly an expectation if you're your parents are really into the music in Ireland and there's kind of a, a fairly good chance that you'll end up playing from a, from a young age. So my father introduced me to Irish music when I was about seven years old um, because there was music down in the local area. Uh, my dad was very in interested in it and my mom as well. My mom um, was always there for us for uh, bringing us to different classes. So we started off on the penny whistle. Um, I don't know if you came from that uh, from that vein yourself but um, in Ireland you usually start on a penny whistle at a very young age and you try that out to get a few tunes because it's sometimes a bit easier um, and then from there uh, my dad started bringing me to uh, concertina classes when I um, developed an interest in the concertina so he started bringing me to lessons with a, a teacher um, from the age of say um, nine years old um, and then for the next maybe seven or eight years I was going to a teacher um, in the local area and the concertina isn't the sort of uh, instrument that you see all over the place that it in itself is sort of uh, unique, right? Yeah, it's become very popular in the last, uh, say, 30 years. Um, so some musicians, um, the likes of uh, Noel Hill or uh, Michal O'Rahalig, um, Niall Vallely, um, uh, some of these musicians are, have been excellent exponents of it. And I suppose that kind of grew out of the um, revival that happened in the 1960s and 70s. 
a lot of these um, musicians develop styles of their own. And so the concertina has become um, a, an instrument that's become very popular all around the country and further afield. And do you remember when you fell in love with it? What was it about the concertina, say, rather than the fiddle, which I think is the best instrument that <laughs> you chose? <laughs> well, actually, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have disagreed with you for a while there, actually, because a lot of the music I do listen to is from fiddle playing. Um, I started out um, hearing uh, some of the local musicians in Gowrie County, Wexford, uh, one of the famous um, Crehan um, musicians, uh, Tony Crehan, who would be uh, related to Junior Crehan. He used to play the concertina down in Gowrie, and he had a beautiful old uh, Jeffries concertina from the early 1900s. And his friend uh, Larry Kinsella had a, a beautiful um, a Wheatstone concertina that he used to play there as well. So it had this very sweet tone to it. And I, one of the very interesting things about uh, Tony's one was he had like this what tweeter kind of button that was on it. I don't know if you've ever seen it on concertinas, but mm. <laughs> some concertinas actually have this uh, kind of tweeter button on it. And so it was like as a as a kid, I was kind of like fascinated with all the different sounds he was making on the on the concertina, let alone the, the amazing tunes he used to play. You know. And and did you find yourself falling into music full time, or was it just a side thing? How did it become a career? Yeah, that's that's strange because in Ireland, um, it wasn't back in the night when I grew up in the nineteen eighties, the late nineteen eighties. Um, the uh, you have to think about um, the World Academy of Music and Dance in UL and Limerick hadn't even started, and. Um, some people were making a living out of it, but it wasn't a thing that you would go in to make a living out of, of Irish traditional music. Um, it was becoming popular, say, around 1994. You had Riverdance coming on, on stream, and then all of a sudden there was a big boom in it, and uh, Gail Forrest and all these different uh, big acts used to be coming on TV. But it wasn't something that you would consider to have a career in. Um, so while I was going through school, I used to play music at local um, in local towns and different halls and different venues, and I be became a better musician along the way through going to competitions. So I went to the Cultus competitions, which is uh, Cultus Kyotari Aaron is the Society of Musicians in Ireland. And, and you know about Cultus, I'd say, because there are branches all over the world now. Um, but I was uh, in Cultus and I was going to competitions every year. So I developed a, um, a competitive approach as well as a, a, a love for it while I was, while I was um, learning along the way. And... <laughs> Uh, this is something that would strike me as a little different to to some of the experience. I know we have a lot of your research to talk about. I hope I'm not dwelling too long on this, but I, it's fascinating to me that uh, th this competition atmosphere, which which is not necessarily the way, of course, again, I'm doing it in a comparative sense, that people in America tend to think about learning an instrument. Uh, what is? Can you describe that a little bit? Did you, were you winning competitions? Were you were you losing, and that made you want to be better? Were you meeting and networking? How does how did that work? Well, I think the major influence on my um, playing it was uh, playing with my my brother, uh, my older brother Larry, who plays the accordion. He's fairly well known in Ireland, um, and my sister Annette. Um, we used to the three of us used to be kind of competing along the way at the at the start. So we became. Um, very involved in, in making sure that we were practicing all the time and learning all the time. Um, and in the competitions, I think I started playing at the age of nine years old and I, I came third, second, second and third. And then after that, I didn't really do an awful lot more competitions after that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was always kind of, you had a certain amount of tunes that you would practice every every year for about six months and maybe about two hours a day. So we were constantly um, preparing for these, these All-Ireland competitions. Um, that used to be in August. So you'd start in February and then you'd finish in August or that. So I was kind of brought up in that kind of a system of um, training. Um, for, for those who aren't uh, familiar with Irish music, can you break that down? And this kind of leads into your research a little bit. How, what are tunes and how are they transmitted? How, how do people learn tunes? So generally in Irish music from a oral tradition, um, you don't generally learn from sheet music um, that much. Um, most of the time people learn from other musicians and it's that immersion by listening to people playing and picking up tunes by ear, which is usually the way that um, people transfer a lot of the knowledge about ornamentation and variations and um, how to properly play tunes. Um, having said that, I did have sheet music with my lessons with my teacher, who used to always provide um, the sheet music and an audio recording. 
And in the audio recording, he would have it slow and then medium and then faster. And in each uh, permutation, he would add in a little bit more ornamentation and variation. It was a very kind of natural way of learning the concertina. And also, of course, you had to shoot music in case you went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but by the time you're, you're competing with this, you, know, you have a catalog of tunes in your head? Um, yes. So um, every year, I suppose, I was picking up more and more tunes as I developed the um, ear training um, to a point where I had probably a good few thousand after, you know, at, at, up to this point right now. But in those years, I was kind of, I suppose I had about 100, maybe at the age of 11, and then, you know, maybe 300 then at 13 and just kind of developing up along and then and just picking up tunes every single day. You know yourself as a younger person, you're always just soaking in all different types of music. Hmm. Fascinating. And and so then at what point uh, you take it and you continue through your uh, young adulthood and eventually you start studying it at an academic level. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your academic background? Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. I started off as a, a undergrad in multimedia and IT because I was really interested in um, playing with computers and what they can do and especially working with um, internet. And so I, I kind of grew up in the, the days of Audio Galaxy and Napster and it was amazing. I just all of a sudden I had audio files that I could just download free and you could just explore lots of different concert recordings from different types of music that I was interested in at the time. So all that sort of um, thing was going on as, as was a teenager developing a, an interest in, in computers. But then I kind of turned from that then to do a, uh, an MA in ethnomusicology uh, at the University of Limerick. And when I went to do the MA in ethnomusicology, I became really interested in like crossover that is uh, between ethnomusicology and IT. And one might ask, what, what is that crossover? Um, it's not something that um, definitely wasn't really kind of pronounced back in the day when I did it, but that was in 2007. Um, but one thing I noticed was in a module in the uh, ethnomusicology course, there was um, ethnomusicology and the internet. And I found it fascinating how um, underdeveloped the concept of um, what databases did, um, what you could achieve with working with um, musical data using computer, computers and what you, you could have online as well, um, what the possibilities were. So then I really started thinking, um, maybe there's a way to bring this together. And that was coupled with uh, a love of um, older recordings, I suppose, bootleg recordings, um, some rare recordings that you might hear in archives like the Irish Traditional Music Archive in Dublin. Um, and my, my whole kind of idea um, grew then that I wanted to see if there's any way of taking this music from archives and sharing it with people and allowing them to kind of, um, kind of give back information about it and feedback what they might know about some of these recordings that had been made during their um, during the last uh, uh, maybe five or six decades. And so you continued it on through the MA uh, to PhD? Yeah, so once I had left the MA, I went into a, um, I, got, I was working in the industry for a while, and um, I then re uh, I went to London where I, I ended up in King's College for a while, um, researching, um, looking at repatriation of digital collections from archives to um, what I used to call source communities, which is uh, just back to communities and indigenous communities in particular. So I was kind of really interested in, in that in that area, um, in how the digital, the digitized um, can be brought back in meaningful ways to these communities. And so there's, there was lots of issues around that. And I, I became very interested in, in what we can do with um, digitized documents. And so that sort of led you to uh, where you are today in the United States. What are you currently working on? Yes, yeah, so what I'm currently working on at the library is I'm on a Kluge uh, Fellowship in Digital Study, but I'm also I'm transferred onto a Fulbright as well. A Fulbright is a Tech Impact Scholar Award. So basically what, what's happened there is that I'm looking at the impact of the digital turn and the trends that are happening um, in, the, in, this, in this area, specifically in Irish traditional music and in America. And throughout this whole process, you've continued to play um, it has has this experience of, of looking at it digitally changed your experience with music before we get into the nitty gritty of your research? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's quite interesting to um, 
when you actually discover some of the um, music that's inside in the American Folklife Center, I think you get a, a really deep appreciation of what lies in America, what in the, in the archives. And that's something that um, a friend in Vermont was saying to me, um, that she, she, she really wished that there would be a uh, Irish traditional music archive of America, which has never been the case yet. But there's all of these archives, just like the American Folklife Center, that have recordings from all sorts of musicians who would have played not only Irish music, but old timey music and waltz music for dancers and into Hebequois music and into Scottish music and all of it mixed up together. And so we're, we're getting pretty quickly into this like sort of dense area with a lot of vocabulary and uh, a lot of sort of, I, I see like lines being drawn. Um, how, do, how does one define what is Irish music versus Quebecois or Scottish or, or other forms? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, actually, because uh, believe it or not, there's not a very good definition of uh, Irish traditional music in some senses. There's maybe about maybe three or four that I've came across that kind of broadly but semi-vaguely kind of describe it. So one of, one of them would be in the Irish traditional music archive, they try to be very inclusive as an archive. So they try to include everything that contributes to the tradition. And in, you can, you know, immediately you can see where that would involve a lot of music that might, you might not think it would be traditional in yourself. Uh, on the other hand, the companion to Irish traditional music by Fintan Vallely, I don't know if you've seen that yet, um, massive volume by the way, and really informative. Um, he gets closer to it when he says, um, from a, a music from an oral tradition that uh, predates recorded sound. So you're looking at music that's not um, kind of transmitted using sheet music, or it's not transmitted using recorded sound as much, so it's more reliant upon um, person-to-person interaction. Now, I find this absolutely fascinating because it has obviously ramifications, not only for music, but for nationalism, for identity, for all these sort of things. And so much scholarship has been done around the written word, Um, you know, the translation, Martin Luther of the Bible, the printing press that sort of makes that accessible and, and, you know, causes centuries of of war um, Mm -hmm. and among other things. Uh, We also talk about... uh, Benedict Anderson's Imagining Nations, where his whole thesis is that that nations are created through printed word and through through newspaper formulations. But you kind of have access to both sides of this as you see the oral um, tradition as well as as the textual tradition. Um, how do you see this complicating, like sort of existing narratives of nation or identity? Mm. Well. One of the things that I think is most interesting, and in, uh, particularly in my PhD, um, where I studied um, the uh, visualization of uh, data from archives and compared it to interviews with um, different people who were like talking about events, and when they come together, how they compare and how does the, um, the printed word compare to the way we, we talk about these um, different events that happened over the years in history. And so it's it's quite a, an interesting kind of intersection between the two. And the digital, um, I think it kind of transcends a lot of these boundaries that were there in a time of print. Um, but we get, we still get a lot of, um, like the earlier days of, of the internet and this digital revolution, we had this more kind of a, um, a replication of the print uh, era. Um, for instance, there's, a, there's an initiative um, started in 2011 uh, called Force 11. And it was started in in, in Germany and they're trying to establish this way of working with the digital that goes beyond um, just replicating what's uh, happening in the printed word in order to talk about more transparency and keep your data um, viewable for people to see so that they can understand um, how you came to the decisions you came to in that actual technology itself. I think that has a lot of ramifications for um, understanding how um, a object, a digital object is created. And in particular, then you get to understand what um, the document means for the person who actually created it versus what had been created in the print, print tradition before, which was a lot more um, difficult to kind of understand the, the uh, process behind it. Hmm. So I, I think that kind of feeds in a lot into um, identi- in issues of identity and, and how we actually put these together. So like when, while I'm creating this um, 
uh, I suppose, a data set of um, music from the American Folklife Center and the library. Um, it's quite interesting to, to um, try and use um, the uh, definition of Irish traditional music because we have all sorts of different um, traditions there. And how, how do we, and I know at one point I was saying like, well, is, is a piece of music that comes from uh, Scotland, the Outer Hebrides, is, is, that, is that essentially uh, Scottish or is that like half Irish as well if other people have sung it before? What about the song uh, Barbara Allen? Like that crosses different uh, traditions and goes in different places. Um, what about um, music that comes from people like uh, I, this guy, John Harrington, I discovered in, in uh, Montana who played waltzes that he learned off the radio uh, and he used them for, for dances for Irish people. So it's, it's all very complicated in that way. So you have to come to some sort of a, um, a decision on how you're going to cross-reference all this stuff. Yeah, and this this is one of the reasons the conversation with Sarah was so fascinating, and and she really traced these in between stories of going back and forth. Now you've sort of added a, a, this similar wrinkle of looking as well at America and and specifically you know the various American archives and American um, spins on Irish music because you're you're engaging with this wider Irish community. So so how wide are you going? How big does this get? Uh, this project? Are, are you looking everywhere in every nook and cranny in the United States? <laughs> it, it could get very big. And, I'm, and I think there's a, there's a job there for a team of researchers for about 16 years. Or maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Especially um, you think about places like the Ward Archive in Wisconsin and um, that's in places like the Seamus Connolly um, uh, the Boston, in Boston College. And there's multiple different archives all around um, the country. And not to forget um, the private collections that people have. Um, only last week, someone sent me a, a reply onto a, a blog I created, um, asking me if it was okay if I if I would uh, um, would would I take some of the recordings that they had because they wanted someone to to save them and you know to, to have them for other people to hear. So it could you could go on and on forever um, trying to uh, write all of this in, but. What I decided for this short project for the moment was to uh, just focus on the American Folklife Centre and what Irish traditional music lies across the collections within the centre itself. So I, then, I have identified like basically 37 different um, collections that are in the Folklife Centre and a subsection of that uh, was used as a sample to, to develop a digital project. And can you, so for the people who aren't familiar with this, uh, can you explain what the American Folklife Center is and, and how you use that for your digital project? Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting um, as an archiver of uh, a Folklife Center because it's, it's, um, it's got formats, it's got um, uh, music from different formats in different eras, everything from, uh, in Irish traditional music anyway, from 1903, all the way up to uh, 2014, as late as 2014. Um, and these are very different types of collections in some ways. Like some of them are, say, Alan Jabour going out in 1977 to West Virginia and recording a, a fiddler playing tunes and getting his fair biography, um, to Montana Folklife Survey, where someone goes up to um, Butte, Montana, and then records everything from... Uh, people's tunes to their biography uh, to even uh, recipes for Irish pasties. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you get a very big broad spectrum of different types of collections along the way. Um, they also have, um, you know, the wax cylinders from um, the early 1900s that were made by Captain Francis O'Neill, you might be familiar with them, mm. um, by, um, by Patsy Tuhi and, and, and they, they would have um, access to those collections as well. So it's not just everything that's in the, the, the library itself, it's also replicated material from other places. And in all, all this material um, that's been reproduced and re-recorded and transferred and, all, and you know, both through the oral tradition, the written tradition, recorded tradition, uh, who owns it? We have this issue with Wikipedia of, you know, paywalls blocking access to relatively new academic information uh, because of sort of ownership and intellectual property. Is this an issue that we see in Irish music as well? Absolutely. Um, you, this is something that um, in my um, experience, I'm going to conferences in particularly in ethnomusicology um, for the last um, 15 years. I've, I've discover that um, the issue of copyright comes up all the time. <laughs> you can never talk about digital unless you're talking about copyright, it seems. 
But um, in some ways, those laws are kind of um, opened up in some places. They've opened up in um, in the UK and, and and Europe in some ways, and in America too. They're 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 working on making some of these recordings available in different ways. So um, you. There has been digitized some digitization, but not all of it um, is is available, and not all of it will be available for a long time to come. So we have to find ways of um, working with kind of the, the data that that describes it, or ways of of um, being able to access knowledge about what is in the collections in more detail. And now you're doing just that with your data collection and and sort of. Uh, reaching out to people all over the place who have uh, who have this knowledge about Irish music at some level. Can you talk a little bit about how you collect your data, what you're looking for, and what you hope to find? Yeah, so the, the actual um, project in the library itself um, focuses on uh, building a data set of performances of tunes, songs, and dances from all of these different collections. So I cross-reference with the website irishtune.info um, and I use that as a, a basis to find um, material that's from Irish traditional music and that kind of links into the conversation earlier on. Um, and through through that then I'm able to identify, um, I have like about 2,600 um, tunes and songs and dances from all of these 37, well, not all of the 37 different collections, but um, a, a good portion of it. And from that, then I'm hoping to see how how does how can that be connected um, to other resources that are on the web. Um, so at the Irish Traditional Music Archive, um, a researcher there, Lindsay Weisenberger, has been working on a project, a European project called Horizon 2020 project. Um, it's called Litmus, um, linked Irish traditional music. And what she has done is that she's created a way to actually describe these documents so that we can link them with other documents that are in other archives. So um, another archive that is working on a very similar project to mine, um, uh, and there's some researchers in the Seamus Connolly collection in uh, Boston, and they're working on the project as well, um, allows this the data that they have to be harvested and used by um, other researchers in the future. So it's kind of like linking up these different collections in um, where they have a similar performer or the same title of a tune or the same basically the same instrument or the same composer. Hmm. Have you faced a uh, pushback on this project? People who think that that this sort of linking and sharing is is actually uh, not good for music? Well generally um, a lot of people that are involved in this type of thing um, they realize that um, the linked data is only as good as you put into it. So the more people that um, create this type of linked data, um, the better it is for the community in general. Um, and this kind of goes back to um, what Jaron Lania is talking about in uh, a TED talk last year, where he's, he's um, asking us we need to re remake the internet. Um, and this goes way back to the, the very the pioneers of the internet, like uh, uh, Tim Berners-Lee and people like that. Um, and there's like this open source community that's really engaged with that, um, keeping uh, information open and keeping it shareable. Um, and so a lot of people are very much behind the work that I'm doing. And I haven't really had a lot of pushback just yet, <laughs> thankfully. Um, and in a way, um, what my, my work is like I kind of uh, I focus on working with uh, data about the data itself. Um, so whatever is available and has been digitized, I'll, I'll go for that. Mm. And so that's what I'm, I'm trying to do in, in, in this project anyway. And you are both a, you know, you're working with technology, you're, you're both a scientist in this way, and, uh, you know, an expert on the humanities. You're, you're a musician, you, you know, you, you have a respect for the oral tradition. Uh, do you find yourself being... Uh, you know, pulled into stories in the archives and, and maybe could you share a story that you found particularly meaningful, if that's the case? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's loads of different stories um, that have came up along the way and you can't help but um, look at some of these documents and listen to some of these interviews and, and hear the personal stories that happened for people around America. And one of the things that really stands out for me as a, a person who is discovering more about America 
um, American collections, American culture, and American Irish, Irish culture as well as that. There is a lot of history about the melting pots like uh, Boston and New York and where all music um, was, like a lot of it was recorded over the last century. But there are these places on the outer lying edges like um, Montana and down in uh, California in, in mining camps and over in uh, West Virginia and Arkansas and all these different places around the country where there's really interesting stories from people who led completely different lives to the uh, people who were in, 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 in New York in some senses. And so you're getting this kind of like a outerlying um, individual story. Um, so one of them would be uh, John Harrington, for instance, who was, um, he was born in Utah in a place called Merker City in 1903. And his parents were Irish and they spoke Gaelic. And he, in 1911, he moved to Montana. And then he moved from Montana to West Cork he lives there for seven years. Then he comes back to New York, works on the subway. Um, and then he didn't even meet Michael Coleman, one of the most famous uh, fiddlers, even though um, he was a musician himself. And then from New York, he goes uh, to Montana again. During the war, he works in uh, Richmond in, in uh, California in, in the Navy Yards. And then he moves back to Butte, Montana again and, and retires in 1965. And then he records an album at the age of 96 in 1999. And he lived until he was 100 years old. It's amazing. Uh, the, the, the power of music clearly is something that, uh, you know, that, that keeps people going. I, I mean, we, we kind of hear these stories and see them overly dramatized, but, you know, like the, the, it's, it's kind of extraordinary. Can you talk about that, the, the sort of role community plays in Irish music? And is that lost in your, your seeking of the digital and the data? Or is the, do you still feel the community there? Ah, oh, that's an excellent question, actually, because um, I'm just thinking about that right now. And the, the whole thing with um, this project is um, we very often base our exploration of these items, these, these um, analog items or digital items or whatever, um, and focus on the actual performance itself. And we very often miss what's outside of it and what's around it and all of the context and how they came to be and how those musicians um, got to that point where they were. And so one of the things was in my, in my researches, um, I've been building out a data set um, with, with the tunes and the performer and the location, but also the stories that come with it as well. And so some of these stories are fascinating. And you know, you know yourself, you'll often hear um, an Irish musician, the person who plays Irish music, they'll, they'll talk about a tune and there's a particular story or a joke or something very interesting about a story, a tune that will connect to something else. And so a lot of those um, stories have been captured in it. And very much this kind of thing is connected to community and the whole sense of um, the, the, what goes into these recordings itself. And it says a lot about the values of the people. And, and I think you kind of lose that if you focus too much on the item itself. You know? if you, and, and so this is where, uh, like some of the recordings, um, because in the wax cylinder format, it's very short. So you, all you get is the title of the tune and the tune itself. Um, in the 78 RPM era, you kind of get the one side, maybe you get, might get the title and the name of it and, and something about it. And then the flip side, then you get something short as well. But when you get to the reel-to-reel -reel and the uh, audio cassette uh, tape era, and particularly in some of the concert recordings like the Philadelphia Keeley Group or um, the Washington Irish Folk Festival, there are these really fascinating finds where people are talking at length about these tunes and songs and dances and introducing stories about them. Um, and that is really one of the core parts of the tradition, as you, as you know yourself, um, and a really important aspect of it. So, yeah. Yeah, and so the Philadelphia Keeley group is something that has uh, come up before uh, as as in in one of the articles I was reading about your work, the you mentioned that it's just an enormous resource. Uh, they they have these archives. They have recordings that go on for hours and hours, and and we need people to pick it up. What are your sort of suggestions for someone who who is interested in this music but but doesn't quite know what angle to approach it at? Hmm. There, there is a, a really interesting thing about um, sitting there uh, working on the Philadelphia Cayley Group um, from when it started in the late 70s all the way up to the 
late 1980s. And that's the, the access I had to it um, in the American Folk Life Center. One of the things about it is that you get um, the passing of some of the older musicians of the local area. So not really big stars at the very start of it. And, and you get a, a young Mick Maloney, for instance, introducing all of the different performers. And as the festival develops, all of a sudden you're getting more uh, musicians coming over from Ireland. Um, and then they're mingling in with other musicians from the local area. And you get this real sense that um, there's a, a, a kind of delivery of um, a whole story about Ireland to uh, people in the audience and trying to explain what music is about um, and giving different anecdotes about the tunes and performances. So um, it's, it's a world of treasures and like all of this music is like also the careers of people. And so you're getting kind of like set lists of say, Frankie Kennedy and um, Mariadne Weinig, um, uh, Christy Moore, Noel Hill, and people like that in, in the later 80s. But you're also, in the earlier times, you're getting like Eugene O'Donnell and Gene Kelly and Cus Tehan and people like that. And a lot, of, a lot of those performers who you wouldn't normally hear in Ireland are captured and, and preserved in the American Folk Life Center over here. Hmm. And you talked a little bit about your sort of unique position where you're coming to the U.S. and learning American culture. At the same time, you have this this great wealth of knowledge in Irish culture. And, uh, you know, as you can see from your name, Padre, you speak Gaelic and you and you does that give you insights? Because there's a big conversation in the humanities now about language and the study of language it's something that often takes a long time for historians to do and as you know it's kind of being pushed aside in colleges how has how's language ability sort of helped you on your way yeah that's quite interesting actually i'm i've always uh, loved uh, uh, the irish language um since even my days in school i was um, very interested in it but when i left um uh, school and, uh, and when I was in university, I became way more interested in it at a deeper level because of the um, the work I was doing in archives and getting more into um, reading Irish um, books and anything, listening to Irish on the radio all the time. So, we, well, we have access to the Irish language every day in Ireland. Of course, it's um, the Irish language station radio on the Gaeltacht that is on every day. Like um, my family used to listen to it at home all the time. So, um, that was something that. I had a, um, an advantage to have um, by the time I had started my PhD, but I had to take it in a more serious direction, actually, even again, when I was in, working on my PhD, as I was, uh, I was working on the uh, career of Sean O'Leary, who was a, a famous composer in Ireland in the 1960s. And his, his work led to um, bands like the Chieftains and the Botty Band and Day Dannon, who became really famous um, uh, uh, powerhouses of Irish music in the 1970s and 80s. And a lot of the documents that were in Sean O'Reilly's uh, archive back in uh, University College Cork in the Boole Library, they were in uh, the Irish language as well. And so much of my work on that collection, I, I, I needed to learn more of the Irish language to a, a proficient level and also to read books on, in, on the subject itself in Irish. And so that became part of um, both my education and something that I did on the side. And is, is that sort of lost going to these archives or how, are, how does that translate to the digital? Are there two names? Does any of this make it over to the United States? Yeah, it's quite interesting actually. A lot of performers um, introduced Irish language material. So um, we were just talking about the Philadelphia Kelly group. Um, the performer uh, Joe Heaney or Joseph Wahinu, um, he was a great singer from uh, Connemara, which is in the west of Ireland. Uh, he used to come to the... Um, festival in, in uh, Philadelphia and so he'd be introduced in different songs and I was I was happy happy to be able to understand what he was saying so I could actually cross check it against um, song, the, the actual correct spelling and everything and make sure that I had the, the right um, name for the songs and this is the important part of the research is because if you have the correct spelling then if it's been if your uh, data set has been searched by uh, some other scholar or some um, scholar's machine that's looking for that data um, they can find it much easier. And so it's important to have the correct spelling of it. And very often it, that's not the case then with the Irish language. So it's kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's an uphill struggle for that. But we have scholars like, um, as I mentioned, Lindsay Weisenberger in ITMA, and she has um, developed this, um, as I was saying, this, what we call an anthology, which describes the music. 
and she has provided the English version of the names of the types of tunes, but also the Irish version. So if you had a, a jig, you would have port. Um, if you had a hornpipe, you'd have corn fipa. So you have the the um, access to the Irish Irish language versions of it as well. So that kind of levels out the playing field, if you, if you like. Hmm. And uh, as you continue and as you sort of transmit this music in your own way, do you see yourself as um, someone who's creating his own archive? Are you... Do you annotate tunes? Do you write them both in English and Irish? What What is your role more as a participant rather than a researcher? Um, you mean in the actual project itself or are you talking about in general? Both. In the project itself, I'm really interested in um, discovering for my own uh, repertoire as well. So I'm constantly searching. This is one of the other reasons why I, um, this work appeals to me so much as well. Mm -hmm. um, over the years, I've, I've uh, spent a lot of time on websites um, such as the Fiddler's Companion, for instance, which would have lots of stories about the tunes, um, lots of tunes annotated already, and you could learn for hours on end. You could find out different tunes that you never knew about. And so this is one of the things I'm, I'm also doing as a personal exploration too, to find out what sort of gems are in this collection that I haven't heard before? What sort of things can I, can I discover as a musician, as a performer? And what sort of stuff can I uh, perform for people um, when I'm um, touring across America at, at some point? Or, you know, what, what can I record for people to show them what's in the archives in the American Folklife Center? So it's all in the, the spirit of trying to see how can I um, show people what they have in a way, you know? Hmm. And do you, how do you see this working out going forward for... Uh, Irish traditional music. At what point does it does it stop being traditional, and start being you know sort of innovative new music? Mm, that's that's really interesting actually because there's um, again that the problem of trying to define what is Irish traditional music. I mean even defining it is putting it in a in a box itself, and so that's one of the one of the the hurdles that that is there for it. But um, what we what we've defined within the collections is quite interesting, and having that. Um, accessible is a really important part of remembering what's what's there and and also um, if you look at some of these concert recordings um, it's performed memory as well so it's people's experiences and like even some of these tunes in the collections are not even Irish tunes and you know, there's gavots, French gavots there was a big interest in, in all sorts of um, different cultures in the 1970s so you get lots of different types of music in these collections anyway so it's a it's kind of ever evolving and this project is kind of just really kind of bringing out what's what's there and just pointing towards what what is there for people to access and and moving forward like we can really build on that and it's only a start really um the project that the itma the litmus project is quite interesting in that in that way because it's the first time that an ontology has been created for um Irish traditional music and so and it's replicatable across um, all different types of cultures as well in some ways because it's got um, a specific um, a direction towards um, oral uh, traditions. Do you see a sort of continued wave of this? Are, are more um, Americans now interested in Irish music? Do you think that the access to archives will increase interest? Um, or is this just a niche subject that uh, that that doesn't have this original immigration push fueling it like it once did? Yeah, and of course, you definitely you have your like it's, it's Irish traditional music is really fashionable right now in a way in Ireland. Like you know, when I was growing up in the eighties, it was like um, it wasn't a cool thing to do in school, <laughs> right? It wasn't uh, definitely wasn't a cool thing to to know about, and uh, you didn't get kudos from your from your friends or counterparts um, if you played Irish music. Um, and even though it's uh, really popular, um, it's we're only now really starting to understand um, what what is happening in the Irish traditional music community because academics um, such as uh, Jessica Cawley in University College Cork, Francis Ward in uh, BCU, and uh, Ledlin here in in America, um, and Lindsay as well, it, a lot of people are are starting to concentrate on the Irish traditional music community and pretty much. Uh, most of their research has been focused on how people interact with the internet and use it. And we find that there's a lot of people um, using uh, internet resources and a lot of people interacting in Irish traditional music. Um, and there's a very big community of, of people interested in this. Um, so 
as I mentioned in earlier on, my survey on Irish traditional music in North America is sort of like a, um, a kind of a follow on from uh, Francis Ward's survey back in uh, 2016, where he was asking um, what is the engagement of people with um, things like thesession.org or um, how, what do they do when they um, use the internet and is it an, an important part of their lives? And so you, re you really get the sense that um, there's a lot more work to be done in trying to understand how archives, um, where, where do they stand in the digital age um, after the digital turn? What, what, what is their role right now? How are people using these archives? We, we still don't really know that. And this is part of what my survey is trying to um, start to interrogate and trying to find out um, are, are there so many musicians in, in America? And we know, we know that there are, like we, you, are, you see people in every state you go to in America and early there's a, a session of Irish music or a few. <laughs> um, but um, to try and get a real extent of that, um, the survey that I sent out is really starting to bring back like hundreds and hundreds of responses from all over the states. So I think there, I think there is a very vibrant community of it, but um, yeah, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, is that, that's for another day to kind of, Trying to scope out, you know, if if Irish music in general is is going going through a a boom time and a and a bust time, <laughs> it's like an economy. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit it's a bit unfair to ask people to look into the crystal bar ball um, and <laughs> and see into the future. The crystal bar would be nice too. But uh, it, one thing that's clear from from listening to you talk about Irish music and and to anyone who's seen you play as well is is that you have a great uh, appreciation for music and, and it's uh, changed your life in, in a way that you know is, is clearly a positive and, and clearly you know makes life more meaningful how do you share that with uh, the world through your research what are your plans are you gonna create a website where people can access this archive are you gonna write a book are you gonna record yourself are you gonna go on tour what are your plans <laughs> well, that's a very big question now, and I, I think I could go on for a while there, but uh, put me on the spot there is a, it's a tough <laughs> one. Um, yeah, I, I, one of my things is that, um, like, the, the work that I do, I um, was mentioned in the Force 11 group there earlier on, and they're interested in making, uh, making data um, findable and accessible and interoperable with other archives and reusable as well so that other people can improve on it. And so that is the kind of spirit of the work that I'm, I'm trying to do and something that I've always um, tried to be involved in. And that's where the work at the moment in the, in the library is taking me. And so um, I'm, just, I'm just really interested right now on, on building upon that and seeing um, and also understanding um, the situation over here, because it's quite interesting to see how Americans react when I talk to them about um, my interest in, in Irish traditional music in America and the crossovers and, you know, hearing people's experiences over here because it's so different to what I grew up with in Ireland. And so that's one thing that's really kind of fascinating me at the moment. Where that will go later on, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, and again, that's sort of the unfair question. Now, um, one unique thing about this is, is that, and one cool thing about this episode is that you've been suggesting things sort of throughout the episode and, and giving a bunch of names, a bunch of links, a bunch of examples. You say there's a session almost everywhere in the United States. Uh, if, if you were new to the scene, but you had the background knowledge, uh, what would you suggest to people new to the scene who might want to get into Irish traditional music? Well, actually, now that you mentioned it, um, I remember listening to one of your podcasts before and you mentioned uh, that great book that I uh, need to read again, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Last Night's Fun by Car Kieran Carson. Mm. That's, I think that's one of the, the greatest reads in, in, uh, in understanding the, the kind of nuances that are in Irish traditional music and you know, very often it's a very informal sort of a performance when you see people um, playing Irish music and they, they, it seems that it's not as studied as, as classical music or some other more formal uh, types of music. But when you when you understand the nuances of it, I think you can appreciate it a lot more. And I think uh, Kieran, Kieran really kind of gets into that and in a very poetic way, in a very uh, philosophical way too. Um, I think one of the one of my favorite quotes in it is where he's uh, he's saying uh, he's traveling to a place called Castle Blaney, which is in uh, Monaghan, and he sees this guy on the on the side of the road, and he, he asks him the question. He says, um, "Is that?" Um, he says, "Am I in Castle Blaney?" And uh, the guy goes, uh, 
no, this is castle planning. <laughs> 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 and so that's the, that's the kind of, um, the kind of wit that's there, like in the humor that's in it. Um, it's a very much a strong part of, of Irish traditional music is that, that wit and humor and the community aspect of it. And uh, uh, for people who would, who want to fill out your survey, is that still available? Is that still online? It is, yeah. So um, the plan with the survey is um, I have contacted um, people all over the country in various different organizations. And uh, I'm going to have um, another uh, two, or, two or three months left uh, on that. Um, and I'd love to have responses from people all over all over America um, and Canada as well. So Canada is being included in it to, to try and uh, uh, not... not uh, leave them out of the, the picture. Um, I didn't, I did yeah. So that's the, that's, that's available um, on my, uh, be available on my website, patrickegan.org, the English version of my name, P-A-T-R-I-C-K-E-G-A-N.org. Oh, perfect. And we'll have links to that as well. Now, um, you've been in America. I, mean, I just have a few final questions I've got to ask because I haven't, you know, sort of, uh, I have I I I had a lot there, and we could keep talking, and and this long form stuff is great. We're getting very close to an hour, though. So, um, one of the things you mentioned frequently is American culture, um, and you alluded a bit to the you know sort of the powerful cultural wit that you can read about in last night's fun, and how that plays an important role in traditional sessions. Uh, just going to sessions, how have you noticed that uh, different in American culture? Oh, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's quite a few differences in some ways. Um, um, my um, community at home in, in Wicklow, um, we used to have sessions uh, every Saturday night. And um, I think the main difference is that communities are so much more uh, knit in Ireland because it's such a small place. It's, um, it's like one sixth the size of California. Like, so it's so small in, in American terms. Um, and then with that, then everyone kind of knows each other and there is a lot more kind of like uh, over and back and a lot more, um, I suppose there's a, a lot more interaction with people in a way. And it, I think it takes a longer time for it to happen in America, it seems. That's only a personal opinion about it. Um, it just seems that in, in Ireland, people kind of already kind of know each other from uh, the local area. But that's kind of changing. Oh. Sorry, I just lost you there. Could you uh, repeat? Oh, yeah. So yeah, it's 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 kind of it's yeah. So it's changing in in Ireland in, in a way as well, but um, it just seems a lot more closely knit in, in, in Ireland. But then again, I spend a lot of my um, adult life playing music in towns as well, so I can't really speak for the general, uh, the general uh, area of of the United States of America. I'm about to find out a bit more because I'm, I'm a bit more traveling now, and I and I can. Um, travel to places a bit more remote than uh, Washington DC and New York and some of the, the, the cities I've been to. And one of the things, like you mentioned, in the United States is the massive size at a, there and the regional differences that I'm, I'm sure you're going to encounter. Um, right now, one of the things that's so great about your research is that you're working at the Folk Life Center at the Library of Congress that uh, sort of brings together a lot of these traditions from different areas, uh, but it seems there's still a, a lot to explore. Now, can is the Folk Life Center open to anyone? Yeah, you can visit the Folk Life Center and you can go in and you can ask questions and you can um, ask to access material. Um, some of it is not available, so it's best it's best to actually kind of um, do some research before you go in and see what it is you want to kind of find out about. And then one of the best ways I think is to contact a reference librarian. And then you can you can really kind of get the best out of it. But I think sometimes just if you just call in, it's not going to be as easy to find what you want <laughs> in that you know in a, in a short space of time. That's fantastic. Well, uh, so you've given us a suggestion. You've given us many suggestions, but now this is those were just kind of uh, fake ones. What what is your big suggestion for all the hour of history uh, listeners? Uh, I'd say watch uh, Jaron Lanier's how we need to make, remake the internet TED talk of two, April, 2018. Perfect. And we can go back and understand what the internet was supposed to be. <laughs> Absolutely. Quite thought provoking and very philosophical and quite clear as well. Okay, awesome. My suggestion is going to be, uh, actually I'm, I'm changing my suggestion as I think about that. 
Um, this, this actually might be the stupidest suggestion I've ever given, <laughs> but, uh, I know, but I'm kind of inspired by it now. Um, there, I've watched a lot of really great Irish traditional YouTube videos that have like 100 views, you know, yeah. like, like there are some incredibly awesome, uh, uh, recordings on YouTube <laughs> that are just not very well known. So my suggestion is, is take some of these terms that you find uh, in the archive and in the Digital Life Center and plug them into YouTube and see what comes out. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite interesting, actually. Yeah, you probably would. You probably get some very interesting responses, um, more so than you might get if you just typed in Irish traditional music. Absolutely. Absolutely. And sometimes those keywords change everything. Um, uh, great. Is there now, is there anything else uh, before we sign off here? It's been such a pleasure. Yeah, yeah just uh, uh, another uh, recap on that, that survey. If, uh, if people are interested, uh, just go, go to my website and the links, you'll have the links for uh, later on. But um, I'd be delighted if people all over the States um, will be able to uh, fill in the survey. There's a visualization of it as well um on a on the one of the links that i'm going to send and it shows the amount of responses from specific places and uh, you'll see the you'll see the the places where they were quite enthusiastic about filling it in and other places where it hasn't been filled in as much um and there's also a lot of work that i've been doing um so part of all this whole thing is to make all of these this uh, research available to people uh, in general so it's, it will be available from those links on the website too. So there'll be a lot of um, visualizations um, that I've done of where I found the collections around the country and the access to the different collections that are in the archive as well. So I think that really helps out and not only in Irish music, but in, in, in terms of understanding what's inside in the Library of Congress. Yeah, and I think it's just absolutely uh, fascinating work that you're doing. And, and uh, it, I think it will be sort of pathbreaking, not just for Irish traditional music, but uh, but other other types of music who are going to see this kind of thing and think, what archives do we have out there? And I think it's really great. Um, we'll get to see your work and, and see the representations hopefully sooner uh, rather than later. But I know you're doing a lot of great work and it's a massive, massive uh, project. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, Padraig. It was a pleasure to have you. Hey, thanks. Thanks very much, Steve. All right. On Hour of History, it's our world. Anytime, any place. So long. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to check out our recommendations page at ourofhistory.com forward slash rex. That's ourofhistory.com forward slash R E C S. There you'll find links to the books mentioned during the podcast. And if you choose to purchase one, you'll be supporting the podcast in the process. And if you still haven't gotten your fill of the Hour of History, make sure you head over to the Hour of History blog found at hourofhistory.com forward slash blog with articles being released fairly often on topics relating to those covered in the podcast as well as others. With that, we conclude this episode and hope to have you back for the next one. Take care. And again, thanks for listening to the Hour of History podcast.